on this edition of Sightings. She's known as the Iron Woman, and she survived World War II's kamikaze attacks. Now, as this once proud ship is being turned into scrap iron, the spirits of her past are growing restless. And I knew immediately that he was a ghost. Dr. Edgar Mitchell knows all about the science that got him to the moon and back. What he's trying to understand is the paranormal and why the government isn't telling what it knows about extraterrestrials. The public deserves to know. People are going into the pit. Bruce Whittier is a Nova Scotia farmer who was raised in a devout Christian home, yet his dreams have convinced him he was a Jewish victim of the Nazi Holocaust. It, it certainly has increased my belief in the spirit world. And it appeared one morning and changed the lives of an Ohio family. Now scientists try to solve the mystery of the Heartland Crop Circle. Welcome to Sightings. I'm Tim White. The USS Cabot, one of World War II's most celebrated and decorated light aircraft carriers, is floating in the Mississippi River tonight, a rusting old hulk slated for the scrap heap. But a movement is afoot to keep the Cabot afloat. Historians want to preserve her as a national monument, and paranormal researchers believe that there are many ghosts aboard the Cabot that must be heard before the Cabot is destroyed. She was a floating landing strip in the vast Pacific, a beacon for sailors and their tomb. She may have won the war, but the great ship that Ernie Pyle dubbed the Iron Woman will soon lose the battle for her own survival. The USS Cabot is the last World War II aircraft carrier of her kind. She was a war horse, and her upper deck was the last thing many sailors saw before they died. Since the war, Strange spectral visions have haunted the Iron Woman. Visitors see shadows, unearthly forms, and report a strange sense of being followed. And yet, when they turn around, no one's there. The haunting is thought to have its roots in the ship's darkest day, November 25th, 1944. That particular day, it was very rough. Uh, the Hancock had taken a kamikaze. We took two, the Intrepid took one. But next thing I knew, I was sitting in a fiery furnace due to the fact that a plane had crashed into the deck just on the port side, and huge explosions and fire and flames and smoke. Captain Howard Skidmore was next in line on the flight deck when the kamikaze pilot barreled into the cabin. Skidmore watched many of his shipmates die. 35 were lost, killed. Some were blown overboard, never found. And some died a day or so later, and so there were two or three uh, burials at sea. The men never knew what hit them. And that may be why, some hypothesize, there are souls here set adrift by this historic ship. Bill Halsey, the admiral of the fleet, recommended the Cabot uh, for a presidential unit citation. Eventually, the Iron Woman was decommissioned from the U.S. Navy. Renamed the Dodalo, she spent 22 years as the flagship of the Spanish Navy. And during that time, the haunting activity aboard the old carrier intensified. The Spanish government, some of the crew members talked about it, and they had their own rumors of, uh, of, the, of the ghost uh, being f freely roaming around the various quarters of the ship. In 1989, the Cabot came home again. Spain donated the ship to a foundation that had ambitious plans to turn the Iron Woman into a floating museum. The USS Cabot has an enormous uh, tradition and history. It should be preserved. Even though the foundation raised a lot of money, didn't raise sufficient enough money. So what has happened is now that the foundation has gotten its, into some financial problems, the, alternatively, they have no other choice but then to sell it for scrap. And as time runs out for the USS Cabot, the strange onboard encounters have increased. As we were going up the stairs, I just I had an overwhelming feeling to turn around, and I felt like someone was looking at me. And when I turned 
turned around, I saw a man and I knew immediately that he was a ghost. Uh, there was no color to him, but I knew what I was looking at. I was so amazed. Sightings of the shadowy form in uniform are on the rise, leading paranormal investigators to surmise that there is a connection between increased haunting activity and the scrapping of the ship. Entities that die suddenly do not know where they are or where they should go, so they remain in that particular site as well. Larry Montz has assembled a team of investigators to survey the cabin. We will be taking meter readings and electromagnetic readings and taking Polaroids to see what we can capture. The psychic investigative team will be walking behind us. The three psychics have been given no information about the ship's bloody rendezvous with the kamikaze. The investigative team will operate below decks where there is no electricity and therefore no visual cues. They will not know what part of the ship they are in at any given time. The goal is for the psychics to rely on their intuitive side for information. Yeah, the temperature is going down. Yeah. Montz is trying to determine if hits on his equipment, indicating physical changes in the ship's environment, will correspond to psychic hits. Almost immediately, Montz records a drop in temperature at the site of the first psychic hit. There's several entities. They're crew members. The cold spot begins to move, and the team follows it. It's one of the larger cold spots that I have felt in a long time. The psychics don't know it yet, but they are moving toward the site where the kamikaze impacted the cabin. I strongly feel a sensation of, like, fire. Now the activity is coming to life on that lower deck and it's blasting out at us. It's coming right directly towards us. This is very, a very active area in here. As the team moves toward the bow, the psychics again feel a strange agitation. There is a sharp spike on one of the magnetometers. It's like pins, pins, like all, all up and down. It's pin pricks. It's painful. Instead of being cold in this room, I feel exceedingly hot. A ship historian later confirmed that the psychics were correct. This was the exact point of impact. And when the team enters this area, the psychic and scientific hits come in a flurry. You can see him bandaged. I can see blood. And um, it's almost like they're removing a piece of metal from his arm or something. Another accurate reading. The team has located the impact point of a bomb that gutted the ship and killed an officer. The psychics feel the officer's presence is permeating several areas of the ship, and groping in the darkness, they try to follow his trail. Suddenly, they stop dead in their tracks. The entity is strongest here. Unbeknownst to them, this is the same place where Jill Alexander experienced her vision of a phantom sailor. He is here now. I am getting tremendous amounts of tingling through my arms. He is slightly up the top of the stairs. Yeah, I have serious... I have oh, just one of the most powerful yeah. entities on this ship. Oh. Are the simultaneous instrument spikes and psychic hits merely a coincidence? Investigators just don't know yet. But if the ship were saved, she could become a rich laboratory for further paranormal experimentation. Paranormal investigator Larry Montz believes that the haunting activity felt aboard the USS Cabot is caused by the spirits of the sailors who died suddenly while aboard the Iron Woman. He believes that these spirits may not know where they are or where to go, and that before the ship is scrapped, further investigations must be conducted to help the remaining spirits find their way out. Next, a space odyssey transforms an astronaut's attitude about life elsewhere in the universe. And is this metal fragment finally proof that a saucer crashed at Roswell? The silver-suited moon man is the icon of MTV. He appears on t-shirts, in commercials, and statuettes of his likeness are given out during award shows. But what most members of the MTV generation don't realize is that the Moon Man is a real man. His name is Edgar Mitchell, just one of a dozen men who have walked on the lunar surface.
and look back at the Earth spinning silently in space. And of the 12 moon men in this elite fraternity, Edgar Mitchell has perhaps the strangest story to tell. You could say it was my first interview with a true extraterrestrial. The sixth man to walk on the moon, Edgar Mitchell still lives in the area of the Kennedy Space Center and its imposing launch tower. Perhaps it's only fitting because the journey that began for Mitchell here in 1971 changed his life in profound and he says mystical ways. While much has been written about the ill-fated voyage of Apollo 13, Mitchell's mission, Apollo 14, was no less historic. Edgar Mitchell, Stuart Rusa, and the mission commander, Alan Shepard, all had something to prove. This mission had to work if NASA had any hope of keeping the space program on track. When the rocket motors begin to roar and shake, do you feel anything or are you lost in the moment? No, you feel it. I compare it to a vertical subway. Those big engines are gimbling to keep us balanced on that thrust vector. And so you feel that motion coming up through the structure. And then there's as much visualization as anything. Hey, we're on our way. When was the first time that you had a moment for reflection? Uh, during the rest periods, you had time to be reflective, to look out the window a little bit, uh, and to say, my, what am I doing here in this utterly magnificent cosmos? And oh my, look at that Earth over there. Look at that moon over there. Wow, look at those stars, 10 times as many as you can see on Earth. Uh, a wondrous experience to see the universe from that perspective. Apollo 14 was a textbook mission, but what Alan Shepard and Stuart Rusa didn't know was that along with the scientific experiments ordered by NASA, Edgar Mitchell was secretly conducting an unusual experiment of his own. Mitchell may have been an astrophysicist by training, but he was a student of the paranormal by desire. When did you start to know about and talk about the things that were uh, rather exceptional for a scientist, uh, the, your interest in uh, ESP and so forth? What was that based in? When did it start? I was initially very skeptical, very uh, standoffish from all of this, till I had a few events happen that uh, said, well, maybe let's look at it a little bit. Such as? Uh, well, I had some people that I respected say, well, you really ought to look at this. There's some things going on that uh, maybe you're not aware of. And so I started reading the literature and discovered there were some rather eminent people in science that had done some very good work that was being dismissed. And that got my curiosity up. In a lunar crater called Fra Moro, Mitchell and Shepard planted the American flag, collected mineral samples, and then, without the knowledge or consent of NASA, Mitchell began the world's only interplanetary psychic test. Mitchell attempted to telepathically communicate a series of classic ESP symbols hundreds of thousands of miles through space to a group of friends and one professional psychic back on Earth. It turns out that the professional scored very, very highly, uh, but he also reported to the press what we were doing. What caused you to risk an ESP experiment in Apollo 14? That's just my nature, I guess. Uh, the question was, if this is real, and if it's something science says is not real, but it is real, then we as scientists, in the purest sense of discovering the unknown, are derelict in what we're doing. And um, that intrigued me. From the moment he left the surface of the moon, everything was different. Edgar Mitchell may have been an astronaut, naval commander, and an MIT PhD, but the press labeled him a flake for his ESP experiment. The criticism was of little consequence, however, because Edgar Mitchell came back to Earth a changed man. He had seen the big picture. The basic event is to see Earth like this in the cosmos like this. And I experienced that, as others have, as an aha, as a getting out of the trees and looking at the forest, a mountaintop experience. It made me realize that what I knew or had learned about us had some flaws in it. And I think being a pretty good scientist and a pretty good explorer, 
I said, this doesn't fit my answers. Let's go find out why my answers are wrong. Since completing his half-million-mile trip to the moon and back 25 years ago, Edgar Mitchell has been on an intensive inner voyage of discovery. He's written a book about his experiences titled The Way of the Explorer. In it, he discusses his controversial views about the origin of consciousness and the power of the mind. He also reveals his belief that we are not alone in the universe. Life evolved everywhere in the universe that the physical conditions were sufficient or benign enough to allow life to evolve. And that means it's ubiquitous in the universe, not just on our little segment of the universe like we previously thought, both in science and in religion. Ironically, the man who cruised the stars grew up in Roswell, New Mexico. And in his book, Mitchell asserts that what crashed there in 1947 isn't at all what the Air Force insists it is. He believes there are alien craft and creatures. Well, I'll start out by saying I have no firsthand experience with UFO and alien business. But in recent years, I have been in contact with people within government. Uh, more than one government, other than ours, whose official duties while they were in government did bring them into contact with information and events that they claim uh, are clearly first-hand encounters with UFOs, extraterrestrials, and so forth. And I find them very credible. They are good military people, like myself. They are patriotic government citizens of sound mind, of uh, the level of uh, rather senior military officers and senior government officials. They've had these experiences, they claim they're real, and I tend to believe them. Then what's the purpose of the classification, would you think? I think that goes back uh, many, many years when we were just coming out of World War II, where uh, the communist threat was seen to be very severe. It was not clear whether these were uh, extraterrestrials or maybe Soviet developments. It's amazing it's been that way for 40 years or more, but that seems to be the case. And in my opinion, uh, all rationale for keeping this from the public has long since vanished. There's no reason to do that anymore. The public deserves to know. He has explored the mysterious expanse of outer space and continues to journey through uncharted territory as he studies the mysteries of the human mind. Edgar Mitchell is a trailblazer with an open mind. Edgar Mitchell continues to pursue phenomena along the fringes of the scientific mainstream through his Center for Noetic Sciences. In an upcoming episode of Sightings, we'll bring you more of my interview with Edgar Mitchell and the story of Dr. Mitchell's investigation into methods of alternative healing, methods that he believes once cured his mother's blindness. Next, after nearly 50 years, one man says he can finally prove an alien craft crashed at Roswell. And a mysterious new crop circle in Ohio. Here are some of the stories Sightings is following in the news. While the internet continues to explode with controversial alien autopsy photos, the real news is back in Roswell, where a mysterious scrap of hardware is being touted as the first hard evidence of a crashed saucer. In Roswell, New Mexico, the story that made headlines in 1947 continues to make news in the UFO capital of the world. On March 24, 1996, this shiny fragment of metal was turned over to Max Littell, administrator of the International UFO Museum and Research Center in Roswell. The messenger claimed that the object was pocketed by a soldier who was part of the wreckage recovery team in 1947. A group of 50 or so GIs combed the area and very meticulously picked it up. And we've been told put it in wheelbarrows and took it over to a central place. And then it was loaded onto military vehicles. The anonymous donor claimed that he kept the debris as a souvenir and didn't realize its potential significance until the recent flurry of news stories about the Roswell crash. We got it on a Sunday, and within about 10 days, we had made arrangements to take it to New Mexico Tech in Socorro. And we had the chief of police here, Roswell, go along with us. 
We told him we needed a badge and a gun and a man to go with us. The metallurgist at New Mexico Tech determined that the fragment was made up of layers of wafer-thin copper and silver. While the analyst conceded that these elements are present on other planets, he was not willing to speculate on the object's extraterrestrial origin. Soon, the fragment, which is now under lock and key at Roswell's police department, will undergo more thorough analysis, and sightings will bring you the results on an upcoming program. In Nevada, at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, researcher Janine Rebman has designed what may be the world's largest ESP experiment. Are you psychic? Find out on the World Wide Web. The Web Precognition Experiment was designed so anyone in the world could participate if they had a computer and internet access. The test is simple and straightforward. In Redmond's experiment, internet users are asked to describe a series of photographs before they are shown on the screen. The pictures run the gamut from the serene to the grotesque. All they have to do is find our site, which is a consciousness research laboratory, on the web and then they fill out some questions about a picture that we would show them and then they click on a button and the picture is presented to them and that way we can see if what they recorded about the picture actually matches what the picture is and that's how we test whether they precognized the picture or not so far over 6,000 people have participated in the online experiment preliminary findings indicate that people who describe themselves as artistic or creative and those who profess a belief in ESP have the highest accuracy rate. The research that we're doing here at our laboratory is literally cutting edge. We know in many ways the ESP exists. Let's push the envelope. And on an upcoming edition of Sightings, we'll bring you the story of a museum curator here who believes he is alive today because of a psychic premonition. We'll have more stories from the news next time. Now, here's what's coming up on Sightings. For years, Bruce Whittier was troubled by nightmares of his torture and death at the hands of Nazis. They died from suffocation because of the bodies on top of me. When Sightings returns, the emotional story of his former life. The nightmares began in 1991. After a lifetime of mundane dreams, Nova Scotia farmer Bruce Whittier began to have disturbing nocturnal visions of Nazi concentration camps and mass murder that placed him at the center of it all. Bruce didn't know what it all meant until he began to suspect that he might have lived before. has always played tricks on Bruce Whittier. This Nova Scotia farmer says he always had a strange relationship with time. Since boyhood, he has had no sense of time, and now, at age 35, he thinks he may know why. The first clues came to him in 1991 after a series of disturbing dreams of another man in another time. Without a doubt, it was not me. Uh, it was a, another man and his wife and two children, an older gentleman and, the, and a dog. I couldn't connect who these people were. They didn't make any sense to me whatsoever. That I remembered it was necessary to go into a hiding place because we were Jewish people. And going into uh, the basement and into like a root cellar. The dreams were different every night. First he was hiding, then crying, then dying. I remember uh, being shot in through the back um, and falling into the trench and then other people falling on top of me, I then realized that I actually didn't die from being shot, that I died from suffocation because of the bodies on top of me. In 1994, Bruce Whittier contacted Rabbi Yonasim Gershom. The rabbi had written a book about people who believe that they are the reincarnation of Jews who died during the Holocaust. I saw them as perfectly normal stories. You see, we have many stories of people reincarnating from disasters and, and wars and, and persecutions in Jewish history from other centuries. And so for me, it was not anything sensationalist for them to say they might have died in the Holocaust and reincarnated. Many people are not aware that Hasidic Jews do believe in reincarnation. The fact that Bruce Whittier was raised as a Christian is not surprising to Rabbi Gershom. 
What I believe happened in the Holocaust is that so many Jews were killed at once and entire family lines were destroyed that these people could not come back in their own village or their own family line. So they sought out the nearest body they could find. Bruce's acceptance that he might be one of these chosen people is linked to a clock, a clock from his dreams. It was uh, black, uh, tall, very quiet, and uh, you'd have to listen um, so still just to hear it even tick. It was as if it was there to keep us company as well to um, that no one would find us because of it, because it was so quiet. At the last part of the dream, I was told that this clock was now in Canada, and it could be found at a new antique shop that had opened uh, on our Route 1, which is our main road in, uh, in the valley. Bruce followed the directions in his dream. He entered the shop. The clock was there. As he was on the phone telling me about this, I felt shivers go up my spine. It was an amazing story. That here was a man who had dreamed of a clock from Europe in another life, and found that clock in an antique store by following directions in the dream. He found the clock, but could not afford to buy it. Later, it would come to him through a strange twist of fate, only one of many eerie connections in Bruce's dreams. At one point, he, was, he thought in the dream that he smelled chicken cooking in the camp. Later on, of course, it was revealed that this was the smell of the bodies in the crematoria. But as a Nova Scotia goat farmer, who didn't know much about Judaism, the only thing he could identify that meat smell with was chicken cooking. So this is a common pattern. It will begin with dreams that are extremely frightening. They have Holocaust imagery. Bruce had never even thought about the Holocaust until he started dreaming about it in vivid detail. And now he couldn't get the genocide out of his mind. What I remember is being taken to a place outside of the camp, uh, my wife and myself, and uh, being taken uh, and stood along a trench. And we had no idea what was in the trench until we actually were made to stand there. And when you looked down in the trench and saw the rest of the bodies, you knew what was going to happen. And then uh, I remember being shot through the back and falling into the pit. And that was the end of my dream. It was an absolutely uh, devastating feeling to know that you actually were being somebody else and you were being shot and you were actually dying. Soon after his meeting with Rabbi Gershom, Bruce agreed to undergo a past life regression with hypnotherapist George McAdoo. I speak direct to your subconscious mind. And I'll say, I want you to move back to that event. And that tunes the subconscious mind to that particular time. And you'll go right back to that event again. Your mind is relaxed, and you are beginning to feel at peace. And you are giving yourself permission mentally now to drift deeper and deeper into your own hypnotic sleep. I was nervous. I thought if my dreams were that intense and left me feeling fearful and scared and um, uh, teary-eyed, what is this going to do if it opens up all the doors and reveals things to me that I'm not sure I'm really ready to, to accept or even to see? What is happening here today where you are? It's a telegraph office. What are you hearing on the telegraph? Some messages in this war. How do you feel about this? I'm worried and scared. I can leave, but I'm staying. I want to know what's going on. Next, Bruce Whittier recalls his own death. I can't move because of the pain. In 1991, Bruce Whittier began to have bizarre nightmares about the Holocaust, dreams in which he was a Dutch Jew named Stefan Horwitz, imprisoned in a Nazi death camp. It wasn't until Bruce talked to Rabbi Yanossim Gershom that he began to believe that he was not only dreaming, he was also remembering a past life. Under hypnosis, Bruce is about to recall his own assassination. You 
could hear them at the door upstairs. You hear them banging at the door, and they just push the door, and you could hear it open. But they don't find anybody, and we're safe now. Under hypnosis, Bruce calls himself Stefan Horwitz and describes his family's futile struggle to survive. How long do you stay here? For more than two weeks. Two weeks? That's a long time. You don't even come out at any time for those two weeks? Very carefully, yes. Nighttime. What is happening today where you are, Stephen? I'm outside with the dog. I'm just walking around. What happens next? The dog's sensing something. His men are there. They yell at me, and they're in German. What do you say? I said, what, what, what? What do you feel? I can't tell you. It's, it's different. It's panicky. And what happens? One of them grabs at me. And he's saying something that I've done wrong. And he shoots the dog. He shoots the dog? Yes. He shoots my dog. I'm being hit. Where did they strike you? Around the head and face. And they move the sacks and to find them. I didn't tell them. No. Once they found you there, they would have found the place. What happens now? They take us all and they shove us. They push. Where do you go? There's a truck, and they make us crawl in the truck, and they drive away. We went on to when he was captured by the Germans, and his family was taken by truck and then by train to the camps. And uh, we had a short glimpse of the camps. Then we moved to the last day of his life. What is happening, Stephen, and where are you? We're walking out of the camp. There are many of us, but they have brought us back together husband and wives, and we're leaving. There are military on horses. My clothes are so baggy, and they fall and down. Continue. You see what's happening. People are going into the pit. But you can't see because of the people in front of you. It's your turn. We come to the edge, and we're standing there, and you look in, and you see people. Just people. Lots of people. At the point when he was about to be shot in the regression, he panicked, and he could feel what was coming, and, and, and he tensed as if he actually had been shot, according to the description. You could hear his voice on the tape become tense, and he started gasping, having difficulty breathing. I feel a sharp pain in my back. And I fall into this trench, and you can't move because of the pain, because there's people falling on top of me. Move out of the body. You tell me what it feels like as you lift out of the body. Oh, there's so many people that are going up. And as you see, this light is so bright. There's rays of blue light that are coming. They're so bright. He described his soul leaving the physical body and going up into the next world. And then he says, I'm not hungry anymore. And this, to me, again, is a very authentic detail because the immediate realization as he enters the gates of heaven is that he's no longer hungry and he's no longer cold. And if he were making up the story, that would not likely be the first thing you would say upon being in the gates of heaven. Uh, another interesting thing, he saw a blue light in the next world and was mystified as to why it was a blue light because in this life he had read in books, etc., that it should be a white light, it should be a yellow light. Well, in Jewish mystical tradition, the light is a blue light. And considering that his own background is some kind of fundamentalist Christian, he didn't see angels with harps, he didn't see Jesus, he didn't see those stereotypical things. He saw 
what I believe Stefan Horwitz would have expected to see, a very Jewish model of heaven. Before, it plagued me every day, wondering, um, is this really real? Is there more to it? Uh, why? You know, the whole, all the questions that one normally would ask. And it wasn't until actually the regression therapy that I now have a real sense of peace. Uh, I feel grounded. I know where I'm going, and I know where I've been. Bruce Whittier believes he now understands his place in time, that he is a link in a cosmic chain that has no beginning or end. And what of the clock in his dreams? The clock he found but could not afford to buy. That, too, found its place. It's my belief that it was the will of God that he have this clock returned to him. Now, the clock itself was a very expensive antique that Bruce could not afford to buy. And as I began to tell the story in conferences around the country, people began to pass the hat and collect money to ransom the clock. And so the clock now sits in Bruce's home. It certainly has increased my belief in the spirit world. And without their help and the guides and those that are dealing with us on the other side, that there was no way that a clock would arrive. Their hand, their divine hand, had to be on that clock, as well as on me to be able to dream those dreams and then eventually receive that clock. The Jewish people have survived. Jewish culture has survived. Judaism is flourishing. The Nazis did not succeed in destroying that. And so those who still have pain from that other life can find much healing in finding out what it was that they gave their lives to preserve. Bruce Whittier's claim that he is the reincarnated spirit of a Holocaust victim is not an isolated case. Bruce is part of a growing phenomenon that Rabbi Gershom and others are just now beginning to explore. Sightings will bring you more stories like Bruce's on upcoming editions of our program. Next, Don and Sue Aaron's life changed overnight when they awoke to a large crop circle on their Ohio farm. There's been over 8,000 people look at the site. Since so many crop circles have turned out to be hoaxes, the focus of crop circle research this year is not on the design, but on molecular changes being detected within the formations themselves. And this year, researchers called seriologists are seeing a bumper crop of stunning formations in the United States. On Independence Day 1996, Don and Sue Arend of Paulding, Ohio, became unlikely stars in the continuing crop circle drama when a strange formation appeared in the family's wheat field a phone call from a neighboring farmer who happens to fly airplanes. She called me and she said, you won't believe what I'm going to tell you, but we were flying over your field and we saw one of those circles that you see in the crops. When we first stepped out there and looked at it, I, I really was shocked. I was amazed. I thought, oh my gosh, um, it was so huge. Uh, we was laying perfectly flat in this counterclockwise circular pattern. Uh, it was a large area it turned out to be 93 feet in diameter the wheat was standing perfectly straight up on the edges of the circle i was just a little uh skeptical plus i just didn't want to alarm the children or anything to, but yet in the back of my mind after seeing how perfect it was i really knew that something caused it phenomenon wise it was unsettling i didn't know if it was a ufo or if it was uh, if it was man-made, but now that I really think about it, I, I, it's not man-made. The mysterious circle of crushed wheat set the Aarons on edge. Their farm had suddenly become the focus of worldwide fascination. It's had quite an impact on our life. It's something that we would have never imagined escalate to this point. There's been over 8,000 people stop in and look at the site. Among the first to be informed was Dr. William Levengood, a biophysicist who has studied hundreds of enigmatic crop circles. He believes the Paulding Circle, like many others, was created by a little-known quirk of nature called plasma. These crop formations are formed by a natural energy that forms in the ionosphere 
Uh, it's called a plasma vortex. Dr. Levengood hypothesizes that superheated ions can form destructive cyclones, electric tornadoes that touch down and create spiral patterns in ice, grass, and crops. There are very active microwave energies inside these vortices. And this microwave energy becomes very intense. By the time this reaches the Earth's surface, it's a hot item. The proof for the biophysicist is in the plant. His studies have consistently shown that the joints or nodes of the plants outside the circle remain untouched, while nodes inside the circle are blown apart from the inside out. Dr. Levengood has established research guidelines now being used by field investigators around the world. After a visual evaluation of the Paulding site, a compass is used to identify possible magnetic anomalies both outside and inside the crop formation. Readings are taken 200 feet away from the circle at chest and ground level. The same readings are then taken within the formation. Next, a microphone and recorder are set up in the center of the crop circle in the hope that electrostatic noise will be picked up on magnetic tape. A magnet is then dragged through the crop, accumulating any magnetic debris within the formation. The crop circle is measured, diagrammed, and partitioned into small sections. A trained field investigator then collects crop samples of 10 to 15 plants from each section of the formation, and these are individually packaged. The same collection method is used to gather samples from outside the circle for purposes of comparison. The data and packaged samples are immediately shipped to Dr. Levengood's laboratory in Grass Lake, Michigan for a detailed analysis. While some scientists believe these extraterrestrial footprints are caused by forces of nature, other researchers believe that the circles are created by forces far beyond our own ionosphere. They are interested in what happens before the circles form. They are interested in what happened to Justine Holtzberry before the Paulding Circle. I smell this horrible smell. It smelled like two or three skunks put together, only a little bit worse. It was very, very strong. It's just a little bit weird, a little bit scary. I think it had something to do with the crop circle. Is there a connection between the unusual smell and the unusual forces that flattened this field? John Timmerman of the J. Allen Hynek Center for UFO Studies believes there is a connection. It's interesting that we've had in the past reports from other individuals who've had some strange odors at the coincident with the sighting of a UFO. Well, that's a kind of a link that some people might say was a cause-effect relationship. What they may be smelling here is the soil that might have been heated to the point where they're it's literally uh, organic tissue breaking down, in other words, or maybe cooked. <laughs> Although crop circle research is entering a new phase of scientific analysis, there are still no definitive answers. But whatever it is, say the Aarons, it's not a hoax, and it's not of this world. I don't think it was man-made. I think it's too perfect of a circle. We farm, that's what we do for a living, and familiar with how a wheat crop grows. I really feel it's something that's not an everyday occurrence, something that wasn't man-made, something beyond the realm of what we could call natural. So far, Dr. Levengood's assertion that many crop circles are caused by so-called plasma vortices is only speculation, although many meteorologists support the theory that balls of supercharged energy could be present in our atmosphere. No one has ever seen one. If you've had a paranormal experience, please write to us at Sightings. Sightings can also be contacted at America Online at keyword sightings. Download images, sounds, and quick time clips from sightings episodes. On the internet, access information about sightings and the paranormal at sci-fi.com slash sightings. Until next time, remember, no mystery is closed to an open mind. For sightings, I'm Tim White. Next on Sci-Fi, Dark Shadows. He knows.
when you are sleeping. Who is he? His name is Freddy Krueger. Nightmare on Elm Street 3, Wednesday at 5, on Sci-Fi. All I want is what's mine. Heaven, heaven. Christopher Walken, The Prophecy 2, Wednesday at 7 p.m. on Sci-Fi.